Gertrude friends, R.E. Merrill here. While we all wait for the great Darlene Allen to finish narrating the new Gertrude book, I thought I would read you a short story about Gert's childhood. I wrote this a little while ago just for funsies, and I think it gives us a little insight to how Gertrude is the way she is. So, here goes. Young Gertrude Stay away from us, you weirdo, Mandy called out, and her two cronies laughed as if she were hilarious. I'm not anywhere near you, Gertrude said meekly. Good, Mandy cried, because we're pretty sure you're contagious. Gertrude's sister Harriet appeared out of nowhere. You guys have nothing better to do than pick on a fourth grader? Oh, Mandy said, dramatically feigning fear. Big sister weirdo Harriet to the rescue. What kind of names are Gertrude and Harriet anyway? Your mother must be a wacko. Oh, wait. You don't have a mother, do you? Mandy's two disciples looked at her nervously as if she'd gone too far. Yeah, Harriet said slowly and menacingly. I am coming to the rescue. She stooped to pick up a rock. Mandy took a step closer, but her cronies did not. You wouldn't dare. Harriet cocked her arm and let the stone fly. It hit one of Mandy's friends square in the abdomen. She burst into tears and turned to run toward the school. What is wrong with you? Mandy cried, backing away, as Harriet bent to grab another rock. You are such a freak! Then, as Harriet cocked her arm again, Mandy and her only remaining friend ran away. Harriet threw the rock anyway, but it fell short of its fleeing mark. Harriet turned to look at her little sister. Are you all right? You shouldn't throw rocks at people, Harriet. They're going to tell on you. Harriet put a hand on Gertrude's shoulder. I know, but I hit her right in the guts. Her chest swelled with pride. And I'll do it again if I need to. Gertrude looked at the big brick building and then back at her sister. But you're going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble? They were three fifth graders picking on a fourth grader. They should be the ones in trouble. Yeah, but you threw rocks, Harriet. Harriet looked at the ground. Oh, well. So what if I get in trouble? What are they going to do? Kick me out of school? I hate school. But if you get kicked out, I'll have to go to school alone, Gertrude cried, her wide eyes filling with tears. Harriet, a woman's voice called from the steps of the brick building. Come on, sis, let's go. Harriet took Gertrude's hand and led her to the school. The woman on the steps, Mrs. Violet, waited patiently for them to get there and then beckoned them inside. The three bullies stood at the bottom of the steps, their arms crossed, self-satisfied smirks on their faces, their positions forcing Gertrude and Harriet to walk between them on their way inside. Don't look at them, Harriet muttered. No problem. Gertrude had no desire to look at them. Once safely inside, the two girls followed Mrs. Violet to her classroom and sat down at the table she pointed at. She took a chair across from them. You are not in trouble, ladies. Gertrude let out a long breath. Good. I don't care, Harriet said, folding her arms across her chest. I know it's not easy being new at a school. How are things going? Mandy is a meanie face, Gertrude said. Harriet kicked her under the table. Ow! Gertrude cried. I'm sorry she's been unkind, Mrs. Violet said gently. I will definitely be talking to her about that. We'll make sure that doesn't continue to happen. How is everything else going? How are you settling in at home? Good! Gertrude said. Harriet didn't answer. Harriet? Mrs. Violet prodded. How are things at home? Fine, Harriet said. Can we go now? Weird, Gertrude said. Weird, Mrs. Violet repeated. Harriet kicked her under the table again. Stop kicking me, Harriet. Yes, weird. Daisy is weird. She told us to call her Daisy. She says someday we can call her mom when we're ready to, but for right now, just Daisy. Gertrude, Harriet said through gritted teeth. Stop talking. Harriet, Mrs. Violet said, why don't you want Gertrude to share? Because it's none of your business, Harriet said, and because Daisy isn't really going to keep us. Yes, she is, Gertrude cried. No, she's not, Harriet cried back. Girls, Mrs. Violet said firmly but gently, let's not argue about this. The point is you have a nice home now and two people who care about you a great deal. So try to enjoy it. The bell rang, signaling the end of recess and the end of the conversation. On the walk home, Gertrude asked, 
Do you really think that Daisy isn't going to keep us? Harriet didn't answer her. Why wouldn't she? We're being really good. Harriet stopped walking and glared at Gertrude. It's not about us being good. Didn't you hear her and Stan talking? They don't have enough money to keep us. I heard them, but she said that God would provide a way. And that's another thing. Daisy and Stan are religious nuts. You can't trust a religious nut. Did you hear that? Gertrude looked behind her. I didn't hear anything. Let's go. Harriet started walking again, but Gertrude ignored her and stood staring in the direction of the sound. On Main Street, between two normal average-looking homes, stood what looked to be a very old, very small barn. It looked so bizarre there, as it didn't seem to belong to any of the nearby houses. It was just a lonesome shed in the middle of an overgrown plot of land. As Gertrude stared, she heard the noise again and gingerly headed toward it. Harriet, looking exasperated, turned around. What are you doing? We have to go back to the house or Daisy will get mad at us. I think I heard a cat, Gertrude said. So? So it sounded scared. Harriet rolled her eyes. So? Gertrude stepped up to the door of the shed and looked it up and down. Kitty? She said softly. A muffled meow answered her. She looked at Harriet with wide eyes. See? She whispered. She's in there. So? Harriet said for the third time. Gertrude pulled on the door of the shed, but it was stuck. Gertrude, don't, Harriet said, looking around. We don't know whose shed this is. We should go. Gertrude dropped to her hands and knees. There was a narrow crack between the bottom of the door and the floor of the shed. She tried to peek through it, but couldn't see anything. Kitty? She called again. The answering meow was much closer this time. Whoa, Harriet said, having heard the meow for the first time. That didn't sound like a cat. That sounded like a monster. She's got to be trapped inside, Gertrude said. She sounds scared. She sounds more than scared. She sounds like she wants to kill us. That's the loudest, scariest meow I've ever heard. It was more like a scream. Right, Gertrude said. A scream for help. Gertrude sprang to her feet and skirted the perimeter of the barn, looking for another way in. There wasn't one. Let's go back, Gertrude. I'm hungry. Just then, Gertrude noticed Mandy and her cronies standing across the street staring at them. For once, Mandy was quiet. Harriet followed Gertrude's gaze, saw the girls, and muttered, Really, Gertrude, let's go. Gertrude didn't understand why the girls were just standing there staring at them. Why weren't they hollering names? Why weren't they hurling insults? Whatever Mrs. Violet had said to them must have done wonders. Gertrude leaned toward the small barn's wall and said, I'll be back, Kitty. Just sit tight. And then she grudgingly turned and followed her big sister through the tall brown grass to the street. Then they turned and headed toward the place they now called home, while Mandy and her two friends silently watched them go. That night, Gertrude couldn't sleep, and she could hear voices downstairs in the kitchen. She got out of bed and crept over to the heating vent. She lay down so she could get her ear close to the hole and listened. I absolutely agree with you, Stan said. Those girls are a priority. I'm just thinking about what else we can cut so the numbers will match up. We've got to sell something or give something up. Give what up, Daisy said, her voice full of worry. There's nothing left to give up. What are we going to go without? Groceries? Heat? Well, maybe we can find a smaller place, and we've got some stuff we can sell. Let's have a big lawn sale. Smaller place, Daisy said in a raspy voice. We've only got two bedrooms now. The girls won't mind. Think of where they came from. I'm sure they'd be fine sleeping on a fold-out in the living room. They'd get to watch TV later that way. Gertrude could hear the smile in his voice. Okay, fine, Daisy said. I'll start going through some stuff tomorrow. I'm sure we could get a little bit for what we've got lying around, and then we can start looking for another place. I don't want to switch towns, though. I don't want to get farther away from church, and the girls just started at that school. Sure. Deal. We'll stay in Winslow. I'm sure we can find a cheaper apartment. Gertrude heard them leave the room. She lay there for a moment longer, but then she knew she'd never fall asleep, so she put on her worn sneakers and crept into the kitchen. She rummaged through the cupboards, which were quite empty, until she found what she was looking for, a can of tuna. Then she surreptitiously slid open kitchen drawers until she found a can opener. Then, one item in each hand, she slipped out the front door.
The street lights cast eerie shadows as she made her way through the silent town. The further she got from her warm bed, the more freaked out she got. She had never gone anywhere without Harriet before. Sure, she was in a different class at school, but she still knew Harriet was just down the hall from her at all times. A few times, Gertrude thought about turning around and running back home, but then she thought about the cat and how lonely and scared she must be. So she continued on. She almost didn't recognize the shed when she got there. The light from the streetlights did not reach the shed, and it was enveloped in darkness. She walked through the unmown grass to get there, and then softly called, Kitty? At first there was nothing, but then she heard it. A loud, scary meow. She dropped to her knees and began to wrestle with the can opener. She wasn't sure how to use one in the light, let alone the darkness, and it took her quite some time to cut through the top of the can. She almost had the job done when she cut her finger trying to pull the cover off. Ow! she said and began to cry. With her undamaged hand, she scooped out some of the tuna and pushed it through the crack under the door. Immediately it was snatched from within. A wide grin spread across Gertrude's face and she stretched her small body out beside the door. Then she fed her friend one juicy chunk of tuna at a time. When the tuna was almost gone, Gertrude drifted off to sleep. When she awoke, a bright light shone on the wall of the shed, and she heard shouting. She had barely realized where she was before she felt strong arms scoop her up. This terrified her, and she began wriggling to get free. Gertrude, what were you thinking? Oh my goodness, honey, you're bleeding! She recognized Stan's voice and relaxed into his arms. Then she saw Daisy standing right beside him, her eyes wet with tears. Where's Harriet? Gertrude asked. Right here, Harriet said. Daisy put her arm around Harriet's shoulder and pulled her closer. Harriet resisted the gesture, but it still happened. Harriet here knew exactly where to find you, thank God, Daisy exclaimed. How did you cut yourself, Gertrude? On the tuna can, Gertrude said weakly. Ah, tuna, clever girl you are. Now where's this cat, Stan said, setting a sleepy Gertrude back down on her feet. Gertrude pointed at the shed door. Please don't hurt her. Hurt her, Stan cried. Of course I won't hurt her. He gave the shed door a yank, but it didn't move. I think it's locked, Gertrude said. Nah, it's just old. Stan gave it another yank, and the door creaked open, but no cat came running out. Stan pulled a flashlight out of his pocket and shone it into the shed. I don't see any cat, Gertrude. She's in there, Gertrude said, and stepped into the shed. She scooched. Kitty, it's okay. It's me, Gertrude. Come here, Kitty. She saw her then, just part of her face peeking around a wooden box full of old tools. Hi, kitty! She scooched closer. It's me, Gertrude! The cat stayed where it was. It didn't come to Gertrude, but neither did it retreat as Gertrude crept closer and then finally reached out to pat its head. Aren't you a pretty kitty? Gertrude exclaimed, even though the cat wasn't pretty at all. The cat was too skinny for its large frame, and its medium-length fur was matted down in patches. It had a large scratch over one eye. Gertrude put one arm under its belly and pulled it closer to her. The cat let out a screech, but allowed Gertrude to scoop her up into her arms. Gertrude squeezed her and then looked at Stan, who was illuminating the whole scene with his flashlight. Can we take her home? Stan looked at Daisy, and they exchanged a look that very clearly said we can't afford a cat. But then Stan shrugged, looked at Gertrude, and said, Sure, why not? Let's go home. The cat didn't complain as she was loaded into the back seat of the car, but she began to tremble violently when the car started and began moving. Stan pulled the car out onto the street, and the cat let out a scream. Wowza, Stan said. It sure got a set of lungs. What are you going to name her? Daisy asked, turning around to look into the back seat. I don't know, Gertrude said. I've never gotten to name anyone before. How about Lucky, Harriet said, and Gertrude giggled. That cat is awful lucky you came along, Harriet said, ignoring Gertrude's giggle. Gertrude laughed even harder. I thought you said plucky. I don't like lucky, but I do like plucky. She bent to look directly into the cat's eyes. You're plucky, aren't you? Then she looked up at Daisy. I would like to call her plucky. Plucky it is, Daisy said, and turned front. The next morning, Daisy stopped Gertrude on her way out the door. Gertrude's backpack was wiggling. Gertrude, honey, you can't take Plucky to school. Gertrude's face fell. Daisy unzipped Gertrude's bag and pulled the cat free. It screamed in protest. Not sure I'm ever going to get used to that wail, Daisy said. Sounds like a banshee. 
I don't feel good, Gertrude said. I don't think I should go to school. I'm too sick. She faked a cough. That didn't even sound close to real, Gertrude, Harriet said. You were thinking you would skip school and stay home with Plucky? Daisy asked. Gertrude nodded enthusiastically. I'm sorry, Gertrude, that can't happen, but she'll be fine right here. She'll have the whole place to herself, and she'll be right here waiting for you when you get home. But what if she gets out and runs away? Gertrude asked. I'll never see her again. We won't let her get out, and even if we did, why on earth would she run away? She wouldn't leave you. She'd have to be crazy. You're her hero, her best friend. Daisy reached out to caress Gertrude's cheek, and Gertrude's face lit up. You have a beautiful, amazing, blessed day now, girls, Daisy said, and scooted them out the door. Mandy and one of her friends were waiting for them the second they turned onto the school street. Oh, wow, will you look at what they're wearing today, Mandy called out. Where do you get such stylish clothes? I've just got to get some like those. Gertrude, sincerely proud of her outfit, said, Daisy made them for us. Harriet elbowed her. Don't talk to them, they're making fun of us. Who, me? Mandy said, bringing a hand to her chest. I wouldn't make fun of anyone. The third bully approached them then and said quietly to Mandy, I thought we weren't going to talk to them anymore. She looked nervous. Whatever, Mandy said, and turned to walk toward the school. What was that all about? Harriet muttered, but Gertrude didn't know. As they neared the school, a boy from Gertrude's class came running toward them. I heard you were playing by the haunted barn, he said breathlessly. What was it like? Did you hear anything? See anything? Gertrude frowned. What haunted barn? Harriet spoke over her. Yes, we play there all the time. And yes, we've seen things. Ghosts. There are ghosts there. There's no such thing as ghosts, Gertrude said. But the boy ignored her. His eyes grew wide and he turned and ran toward a couple of boys under the basketball hoop. Why did you tell him there were ghosts? Gertrude asked. You'll see, Harriet said. At lunchtime, Gertrude looked around the cafeteria for Harriet but couldn't find her. Her tummy full of nerves, she sat down at the closest empty table. Immediately, two boys joined her. She didn't know either of their names. Hi, one of them said. I'm Zach. I'm Alex, the other said. I'm Gertrude. Can you take us there? Zach said. Take you where? To the haunted barn. Gertrude frowned. Why would you want to go there? Harriet said there were ghosts there. We want to see them. We don't want to take one home like you did, but we still want to see them. He talked fast with a high-pitched voice. Gertrude had a hard time understanding him. Take one home, she said. Yeah, Harriet told us about your pet ghost. Don't worry, we won't tell anyone. Even if you don't take us there, we won't tell anyone. But we really want you to take us there. After school. We don't want to go at night like you did. That's just crazy. Gertrude frowned. Why do you talk so fast? Zach recoiled. Sorry. So will you take us? Alex asked. No. Gertrude said, and opened the lunch Daisy had packed for her. What? Zach said. Why? Gertrude shrugged. Don't want to. Fine, Zach said. I should have listened to the girls. They said you weren't cool. He started to stand up. Wait, Gertrude said. I am cool. Zach sat back down. So you'll take us? No. Zach stood again. Fine, we'll just ask Harriet to do it. Where is Harriet? Gertrude said. Didn't you hear? She's in the principal's office. Why? Gertrude felt cold all of a sudden. Because she's been scaring everybody with stories about Plucky. Gertrude gasped. Plucky? Why does that scare anyone? Zach looked at Alex incredulously. Wow, you guys are weird. Because having a pet ghost is scary. Harriet told Mandy that Plucky was going to sneak through her walls at night and cut off all of her hair. Mandy freaked out. Zach stood and stared at the speechless Gertrude for a few more seconds and then said, Come on, Alex. Let's go. Panic clung to Gertrude for the rest of the day. Harriet never showed for afternoon recess, and Gertrude was worried that she'd been taken to jail. At the end of the very long day, Gertrude was called to the office where she found Daisy and Harriet waiting for her. Come on, honey, let's go home, Daisy said. She sounded tired. They sat in after-school traffic for several minutes, and Gertrude wanted to ask what was going on, but she didn't know what words to use. Finally, Harriet spoke up. Did you tell them that Plucky isn't a ghost? I did not, Daisy said levelly, without turning around. Harriet's face lit up. Really? Thanks! 
Daisy reached up and adjusted the rearview mirror so she could look Harriet in the eye. Harriet, why did you tell them we have a pet ghost? Harriet snorted. You should have seen their faces. Harriet, Daisy said sternly. This stupid Mandy girl is picking on Gertrude. Let's not call her stupid, Harriet. Jesus wants us to love our enemies. She is stupid, Harriet insisted. She spells her name with an I and dots the stupid little I with a stupid little heart. She's as stupid as stupid can be. Daisy sighed. Her name is Amanda. She nicknamed herself Mandy with the stupid I and all. How do you know that? Harriet asked. This is a small town. I know her mother. Anyway, what does an I have to do with a lie about a ghost? So they were all so impressed that Gertrude was hanging out at the haunted barn, Harriet began. Haunted barn? Daisy said, horrified. Yes, the shed where we found Plucky. The kids all think it's haunted. And Mandy saw us yesterday when Gertrude first heard Plucky squawking. Then one of the boys in sixth grade saw Gertrude out there alone at night. They were all amazed that Gertrude was out there all alone just hanging out at the haunted barn. And so, I thought, if I told them that we had a pet ghost, they might get scared enough to leave Gertrude alone. There was not even a hint of remorse in Harriet's voice. Daisy finally pulled out onto the street. Harriet, lying is never the answer. But you didn't tell them the truth, Harriet reminded her. They didn't really give me a chance, Daisy said. They told me you were terrifying people with ghost stories, and they told me to make it stop or you would be suspended. It wasn't so much a conversation as a lecture. Thank God it's Friday. We all need a weekend to recover from this. Sorry, Gertrude said. Daisy glanced over her shoulder at her. Sorry? Why are you sorry? You didn't do anything. Gertrude shrugged. They were quiet the rest of the way home. When they entered the apartment, Gertrude immediately began calling Plucky. Harriet snickered. Gertrude glared at her. What? Harriet said. I thought Plucky was a stupid name for a cat, but it's a pretty good name for a ghost. A stack of boxes sat near the door. Are we moving? Harriet asked. Eventually, yes, Daisy said, but those boxes are just for the lawn sale. What lawn sale? We're going to have a lawn sale tomorrow. Why? Do we need money that bad? Harriet asked. No, no, Daisy said. We just need to get rid of some junk. So much for not lying, Gertrude thought. She found Plucky and scooped her up into her arms. Wow, Gertrude said. Her fur is getting softer. Well, she's had some time for some grooming, Daisy said. She sat on the couch and patted the seat beside her. Have a seat, girls. Gertrude, still holding Plucky, sat down immediately beside Daisy. Harriet sat beside Gertrude. Here's what we're going to do, Daisy said. Why don't we let the kids believe whatever they want? If it keeps them from picking on Gertrude, then great. But we're not going to intentionally grow the lie anymore, okay? Gertrude nodded, but Harriet looked away. Okay, Harriet, Daisy said. Harriet still didn't answer. Harriet, I don't want you lying anymore or intentionally scaring people. Just don't talk about Plucky anymore at all, okay? Harriet didn't answer. Gertrude elbowed her in the side. Ow! Harriet cried. What did you do that for? Because if we're not good, Daisy is going to send us back, and then I'll lose Plucky. Daisy gasped. Then she slid off the couch so she could kneel in front of both girls. She took one of Harriet's hands in one of hers, and then she put her other hand over one of Gertrude's. She couldn't take Gertrude's hand because her little fingers were wound around Plucky's fur. Girls, I need you to hear me. I will never send you back. Ever. Gertrude's eyes filled with tears that spilled onto Plucky's fur. Daisy reached up to wipe some of them away. I know you guys have had a rough start to this life, but you are safe now. Stan and I love you. We want to be your parents. We are never going to give up on you. We want to adopt you. Do you understand? Gertrude nodded, but Harriet said, No, I don't understand. Why? Why would you want us? We're freaks. Daisy took a deep breath. Stan and I really wanted a family. When we found out we couldn't have children, we signed up to be foster parents. But we made it clear from the beginning that we were playing for keeps. They placed you with us knowing that you would stay here. You don't need to worry about having to leave. Ever. When Gertrude woke up the next morning, she was delighted to see Plucky curled up right beside her head on her pillow. Gertrude kissed her belly and then looked over to see that Harriet's bed was empty. Leaving Plucky in bed, she got up and went to find her sister. At first, she couldn't find anyone and was scared she had been left alone, but then Stan came inside and grabbed another box from the pile. Good morning, Gertrude, Stan said brightly. 
There's oatmeal on the table if you want to grab some breakfast. Then you can come outside if you want. Gertrude went back to her room to get dressed and then skipped breakfast to go outside. Daisy and Stan had brought out a few tables which were covered in odds and ends. A bunch of people Gertrude didn't know were perusing the piles. Wait, Harriet cried. I have something to sell. You don't have to sell anything, honey, Daisy said, but Harriet had already gone inside. She came out seconds later with a book, which she placed on a tarp that was covered in books. It's okay, Harriet said. I already read it. Okay, Daisy said, if you really don't want it anymore. I don't, Harriet assured her. You could ask Gertrude for a book, but she doesn't know how to read. Gertrude scrunched up her face. I can read. I just don't like books. That's okay, Gertrude, Daisy said. She looked toward the door. Stan, watch out! Gertrude looked and saw a flash of fur at Stan's feet. Her heart leapt into her throat. Plucky, no! she cried, but Plucky had already bolted the length of the building and disappeared around the corner. It's okay, Gertrude, we'll find her, Daisy said. Then she began to call. Plucky! Plucky! Stan began looking, too, calling the cat. Harriet helped as well, but after ten minutes of searching and calling, everyone gave up. Everyone except Gertrude. Don't worry, Daisy said, resting a hand on top of Gertrude's head. She'll be back. She just went off to have an adventure. She knows where her home is. But Gertrude didn't trust that to be true, and she kept looking. Daisy and Stan got busy selling treasures, and Harriet was busy being Harriet, and Gertrude kept up with the search. She went behind their apartment building and crept through the backyard of the next house, all the while calling softly so she wouldn't bother Daisy and Stan. Plucky! Plucky! She didn't see or hear anything and wanted to go into the next yard to keep searching, but there was a hedge in her way. She got down on the ground to wriggle between two of the bushes, still calling, Plucky! When she broke through the hedge into the next yard, she looked up to see a wide-eyed Mandy staring down at her. What are you doing here? Gertrude snapped, desperate to find Plucky. She was annoyed at the prospect of having to deal with Mandy with an eye. I live here, Mandy snapped. What are you doing here? Looking for Plucky, Gertrude said, forgetting for a second that Mandy thought Plucky was a ghost. But when Mandy's eyes grew even wider and her mouth fell open, Gertrude remembered. Plucky wants to cut your hair, and I came here to stop her. Amanda, a voice called from inside the house. Who are you talking to? You better go inside, Gertrude whispered, before Plucky gets you. Mandy began to back away from Gertrude toward the steps that led to the back door of her house. Gertrude followed her. Plucky, she called softly, mostly just to urge Mandy to hurry. Just before Mandy, still traveling backwards, stepped onto the bottom stair, a commanding banshee call sounded from beneath the steps. Plucky! Gertrude exclaimed, surprised. Mandy screamed and turned and ran up the steps. Gertrude let out a giggle that sounded a little like an old lady cackle and got down on her hands and knees to peer beneath the steps. And there Plucky was, staring back at her. Come on, sweetie, let's go home. She scooped her cat up into her arms and then ran for the street. Then she ran all the way home, to the apartment that her new family would soon move out of so they could move into a new, smaller apartment where Gertrude would finish growing up with two people who loved her as though she were their own, and where Plucky could live a long, rich life with a child who had rescued her from a barn that was never really haunted. But Mandy would tell the story for the rest of her life, and though most people didn't believe her, everyone continued to avoid the abandoned shed until it fell in on itself. Many years later, Gertrude's friend Calvin would drive by the ruins on their way to some adventure, and Gertrude would smile, fondly remembering her plucky, her first best friend.